Welcome back. Ask Coach Nate, episode 22. Today we have a very simple premise. How do you get faster? And to some degree, we will debunk what we believe is the myth that it's about more volume. Uh, so, so Nate, you know, we were just kind of chatting about like getting faster and, and like the myth that we both believe, right. That, that, Hey, if you just do a lot of volume, but you don't do a lot of intensity, somehow you'll, you'll get, you'll get faster. So why don't we start there? Like what is actually required to go faster? Yeah. So, I mean, I think in the big picture, usually when I'm thinking about training and the effects that we're trying to get out of it, I generally will think about like different systems in our body that help contribute to um, pushing our limits in whatever area that we're trying to work on. But in order to get faster, fundamentally, like you have to push up against whatever your limitations are by going very hard, basically. So um, as much as some people might emphasize the high volume that elite athletes might train at or the need for like easy aerobic conditioning days, to recover between hard sessions. Like fundamentally, it's the really hard sessions that can drive our fitness forward. And on some level, a lot of the easier miles that we might do in training and um, some of the cross training we might do kind of like helps establish the conditioning that we need in order to be able to absorb maybe higher quantities of really high intensity work. But if, so like, for example, if you look at like a road racer who does five hour road races and you look at a cross country mountain bike racer Mm -hmm. who races for like an hour and 15 or an hour and 20 minutes. Like they both, both of them on the high level might train like 15, 18, 20 hours a week, but the mountain biker does higher volume training in order to be able to do like more high quality, really intense work because their races are very intense. And the only reason they're doing more conditioning to like build up to that is just so they can do like as much intensity as possible and recover very well. And then do another like really hard workout, usually just like a couple times a week. So it's like, we need really hard training directed in whatever systems that we're trying to um, develop. And then we need adequate recovery between sessions that we can go hard again and doing high volumes of anything at low to moderate intensities is really not gonna help you except if you're just getting started and you're going from like four hours a week to six hours a week to eight hours a week, then, you know, pretty much anything that you're doing will make you fitter. But once you're at that baseline of training six, eight, 10 hours a week, fairly regularly, like going from 10 to 12 hours a week is not going to make you better, but making like some of your workouts very hard is going to make you better. Yeah. I think speed's also always relative. Right. So, so I had, and I had exactly this experience where I went from like, was very fit. I was kind of out of shape. Uh, and I started riding a lot. I think I did a one year, 10,000 miles, uh, which is a lot. And yes, I was like a lot faster than, um, other people who didn't ride as much, but I wasn't fast when it came to racing or riding with other people who knew and had the experience to ride really fast to them. I was really slow. Like I could kind of grind it out, but I wasn't a very fast rider. So for me, I, I found the limit of where, Hey, just doing it a lot. Um, sure you can get to a certain point, but then like, if you really want to be able to ride or run fast, there's an, there's absolutely a plateau where, uh, the intensity now becomes the focus. Um, and to some degree, like I had to cut back on, uh, what, you know, a lot of people call the junk miles. I was just recording every mile I rode to like the grocery store or, or whatever. And those are things we even recommended in some very old, cycling manuals that I had, uh, I had enjoyed reading. I don't know if you ever read the Obri way, right? So the guy who won the, the Scottish time trialist who, uh, won, uh, uh, or set the hour pace by doing very unique things with, with bicycles and stuff in his book, he recommends like just this incredible amount of volume and riding to the grocery store and all of that. And for me, I think it's pretty clear that those junk miles actually don't make a big difference. In fact, cutting back on some of them so that I had the ability to rest and then focus on really going hard and going intense and, and going really intense, like way beyond anything that you've ever done that felt comfortable. That was the, the key for me and how I um, was able to get faster. Yeah. And like, even sometimes for people that are maybe focused on more endurance uh, type events in the sport, whether you're a runner or a cyclist, like if you're trying to do marathons or you're trying to do like hundred mile mountain bike events or something like that, like a lot of times those events might actually last much longer than 
you would normally routinely want to be training like every weekend or whatever. Like you don't want your weekend long ride to be 10 hours every week, even if you're focusing on getting ready for Leadville, for example, and it, and maybe you're like, you know, you're, you're fit, but you're not like super fast. So maybe you're going to finish in like nine or 10 hours at Leadville, for example. Um, it, at some point, like you've probably tapped out like the maximum adapt adaptation you can get from just doing more miles. And it's like, like you said, even if you're training for an endurance event, training like 15 hours is not necessarily better than training 10 to 12 hours, but including a good bit of intensity. And for most people, if they're training 15 hours a week, like they just have to keep their intensity relatively low so they can handle that amount of volume. And if you're not doing like hard threshold intervals or VO2 max workouts, like you're not building your aerobic capacity, you're not building your ability to tolerate like threshold paces. Maybe you get really efficient at going, you know, 75% hard, but that's not going to make you faster. Like at a, at a certain point, like, yeah, you can chug all day and suffer through a six hour, seven hour ride just because like you have sheer willpower and you're very efficient at a low intensity, but that is not, that's never going to keep getting you better for Leadville if that's your goal. Um, and I feel like even that like seems counterintuitive, but if you think about it, it's like, yeah, you, you can't just focus on like one particular aspect of your fitness and hope that everything else gets better. And I feel like that's one thing that comes up in like the sweet spot training debate. Like some people, I think sweet spot as an intensity can be a useful tool in your repertoire of types of workouts or types of efforts that you can be doing. But if that's your main tool, like you're never going to enhance your aerobic capacity or your anaerobic capacity in a way that is necessary for any kind of effective racing. And even if you're trying to do like time trials, like you need a better aerobic capacity than you'll ever get from just doing sub threshold work, for example. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I only know this from, from trial and error. And I think that that's, that's the, the thing people need to go through in order to understand like what is hard and what is easy, easy. I think that it's easy to think that, Hey, the ride I did was, was really hard. Um, if you haven't really tried to focus on, uh, intensity, um, and, and doing it at time. So when you're riding with the group ride or you're trying to just keep up with people, there's always moments where you've got to really lay down the power and you can get back onto the, the group or follow the really difficult pace line. But when you really time a, a five minute effort and you're trying to do it, um, at pretty significant wattage, that's really, really different than the, um, the things that you do in a group ride. Cause I think they tend to be much shorter. They're like 30 seconds to perhaps, uh, a minute, but to really lay down the power over five, 10, 15, uh, 15 minutes, that's something really different that I think is, um, is, uh, it's rather unnatural. So you really have to go and find an opportunity, um, to force yourself to do it just like, uh, sprinting. So even like amateur racing, like sprinting is not something that just happens naturally where you go all out as hard as you can for, um, for 30 seconds. So I think in order to get better at it, like you've got to go, um, and find like a environment where you've, uh, have the, uh, 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 everything set up in order to enable that type of training. Yeah. And even just recently, like over the last couple of weeks, I was having some interactions with one of my athletes where we were doing some fitness testing type efforts just to check in on how they were at different points of their power curve. And, uh, we did some like longer high aerobic efforts. We did some shorter, like anaerobic and like neuromuscular type efforts. And, uh, we're actually doing it a couple times because the first time he did it where he was like, he was like cruising, like comfortably going into the sprints, like the, he had short 10 to 12 second, like neuromuscular sprints to check on how much he could just activate his muscles at a high level. And then we had some longer, like one minute efforts to see like both how much he could activate his muscles, but also like do a lot of anaerobic work. Cause if, you know, let, let's say your threshold is like 300 Watts and you go as hard as you can for like a minute, you might be able to do like five or 600 Watts, but you know, half of that or, or, or close to it is going to be anaerobic work. So it's like, that's a whole different energy system. So we wanted to see what that was like, but if you're cruising at like 150 Watts and your heart rate is at like a endurance pace and then you sprint, whether it's 10 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute, like you're already, like you, you can't do your absolute best unless you just totally soft pedal into it and create this artificial environment where you can just do your maximal power for like one effort or for a series of efforts. And like you're saying, like the group ride, 
sure, like you're, you're going very hard, but it's never really focused and you're never doing like your maximal five minute or your maximal like four by five minute type of uh, effort. Whereas in training, like if you're out on your own or if you have a training partner where you kind of have agreed upon the type of efforts that you're trying to do, then you can just really, you know, warm up, do whatever you need to do. And then just entirely focus on doing whatever your interval work is and just empty the tank on that specific thing and then recover for a few days and then do it again, maybe similarly or, or like a different energy system in a way that I think most people don't really fully appreciate like how hard they can go if they really practice going, you know, as hard as they can for a certain duration. Um, and I feel like that's really something that's like integral to any kind of success as an athlete. Like you're always gonna be holding something back, but it's like, are you holding back 20 or 30% or are you holding back like 2%? Because <laughs> even even like world record performances, like they're, there's always like a few more seconds that they could potentially get out of their body, but they're just like, they're narrowing that gap so much smaller than most of us uh, are operating at. Yeah, I feel like if you've done a lot of endurance sports and you enjoy like cycling, enjoy running, most people are really good at holding back. And I think that that was uh, still actually my, my issue is that I've always done these types of things and I just really like them. I liked going for hikes and going for jogs and running around and being outdoors in nature and the ability to like hold back so I could go the distance that I wanted to go. That's a skill in itself too, right? And I think people get really good at pacing themselves. Uh, so to go all out and go really hard, it's very, very different um, mentality. So I remember the first time I broke a thousand watt peak power uh, in, in a spin class. I didn't yeah. even do it on my bike. I was like at spin and they had these sprints or these races and uh, I won the sprint or I won the race, the little, little 30 second thing. And I saw, I got up to like 900, something like, I was like, wow, I think I could break a, break a thousand. I remember, and I remember also thinking like, that was really hard. Like I had never, ever gone that hard before. And the way that it felt was something different that I had uh, never done. And so a week later, I think I came back and, uh, and I just crossed the line. I got like a thousand one or something like that. Uh, and that was, uh, that was exciting. And I would recommend people try things like that. Like um, a spin class is a great environment. It's very artificial. You've yeah. got the measurement uh, there. Um, and so you have the opportunity to like really kind of push and go all out and not have to worry about cars, traffic, the environment, um, gravel, like all the kinds of things that make sprinting on a bicycle uh, very dangerous. And you need to find exactly the right place to give that a shot. I think spin class is a great place to, um, to get started and you'll feel really comfortable because you're not worried about any of those, those things. And then you can just like kind of put your head down. Like, like let your, close your eyes and just kind of go to town and see how far, how far you can go. Yeah. Or just like, if you have like your favorite roads that, you know, are not heavily trafficked and you can just go out and like test yourself on a couple of favorite segments. Like over the years, I find that, um, even before Strava and having a power meter, like I had a few climbs that I really liked. And then obviously having Strava and having a power meter, I would go out and just like, sometimes just hammer certain Hills that I knew. I liked and I knew like how hard I could go for how long and it is easier if you're familiar with the setting than doing it in a, a new environment but like sometimes yeah like I would just deliberately go out and like try to see if I could set a PR on a certain segment or see if I could set peak power or I would check in on where I was in my fitness as I was developing through through a given season uh, and I feel like a lot of times people don't do that adequately well um, and they don't give themselves enough rest between hard workouts to really be able to go hard. Um, and yeah. I feel like, yeah, there's a lot of learning there for people. Yeah, <laughs> no, know. I, I think that that's where a lot of the like ride slow to ride fast comes from is like, you do actually need to go slow. And most people probably ride too much just in the middle where they go out and they have a good time. They ride with their buddies. And, uh, so they're all kind of like riding fairly hard to go slow it's um it's kind of like not as much fun to ride with other people or or I don't know anyone who wants to ride really slow with me perhaps that's the other other challenge and so I found that to do like a slow ride uh I need to kind of do it solo uh and I only know this from just kind of experimenting I was telling Nate earlier I was point where I was feeling really good and my fitness was great and so I don't know why I just wanted to go and set some crazy PR and I did this like 15 minute segment and I got my my PR and I felt awesome. 
And so the next day I showed up at the race and like, I did not have what I needed to, to even survive a few laps in that race. And now I have a really good understanding of like setting a 15 minute PR the day before race is not a good idea. And that will not ensure that I have the uh, uh, strength and the stamina to do well in a, in a race. But I would recommend people uh, give it a shot to just see what does that mean? Because for me, it does mean like there is a certain moderate level that I can achieve um, and it's very comfortable. And that for me still will um, um, qualify as a, uh, as a rest day. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that was one thing that was interesting um, over the last several months going back between like running and cycling and different workouts that we've been doing that we like you were kind of noticing or like we were noticing that the difference of even just like 10 or 20 watts sometimes like your average pace on one of those intermediate sessions before a harder workout. Like if you do 220 for two hours versus 200 or depending on the, the rider, if they do like 160 versus like 145 average for a couple hours before they do a really intense session the next day, it doesn't feel like that much. Like that, that might be a totally comfortable pace doing 200 or doing 220, but just that little bit difference in how much glycogen you're using, how many total calories you're burning, how much it takes to recover from, you know, a thousand kilojoule ride versus an 800 kilojoule ride can really impact the workout the next day that is kind of the focus of doing the, that more intense, um, you know, interval work or, or the race that you're doing. On the other hand, like some people really don't feel great if they totally soft pedal around for an hour or two before race day. Some people feel much better if they, you know, ride comfortably and then they do like a couple of sprints that are really hard or, or something to just make their legs feel like they're kind of woken up and ready to go hard. Um, but they don't do like so much work that they get tired from it. And I feel like that's one thing that a lot of people can really um, benefit from both learning what in training is required to recover well before the next hard session and practicing that in training. So, you know, before racing, like what's going to work well as a pre-race routine, like, is it going to be better to take the day totally off? Is it going to be better to just ride around really easy or run around really easy at like 50, 60% of threshold power? And it's just like totally, you know, like barely getting warmed up or is it going to be like, riding, getting warmed up, doing a couple of hard efforts, but not that much. And then, you know, shutting down the, the ride before you get tired. Cause like some people thrive on doing 45 minutes, just soft pedaling. Somebody else might do well with an hour and a half and like five minutes of tempo and two or three, like pretty intense sprints just to feel like they're ready to go hard the next day. And you don't know for you what is perfect unless you try it some in training and then implement that the day before a race. Or... Yeah, I think this is where me and you are both really aligned and we both get very existential that we agree that like you need to go really hard and then you need to go easy. And I think we even would define like hard means like a few days, two or three days a week, probably not more of going hard and hard means really hard, like setting PR, like trying to break whatever your max peak power is in spin class, like um, doing those types of things. And then easy is like, yeah, keeping it dialed back, going easier than you typically typically would but like in but but there's a lot of nuance between all of that like how much at what wattage can you do for an easy ride and like yeah. I found myself that there was a big difference between uh over two and a half hours of 20 watt average so if I did yeah 200 and something watts for two hours but then I did 180 watts 180 was like uh uh made me feel a lot more uh rested the next day and I only know that from from experimentation. And I think that that part is really unique to each individual where you're at in your training. Um, there's a lot of variables. Uh, and then the other thing you're talking about is like what you need to like feel good the day, the day after or the day before a race. That's different too. Like I've heard people who believe in blockage that they need to go out there and do something actually rather intense in order to like get their power up where it needs to be. I don't think I've found that to be the case for myself. Like I like to go pretty easy and do things pretty easy. Like when I set up, set a one mile record recently, I don't think I even did anything the day before. And then when I got to the track and I think you even recommended some harder sprints and stuff. And I just ignored them because I had done them yeah. in, the, in the past. I'd done the hard like warm up, and I like this warm up was too hard and I couldn't get to where I wanted to go. Yeah. So I just kind of ignored all that. 
and I just got out there and kind of warmed up and then I just went as hard as I could and I got my, my PR, right? So everyone is, um, is different. And so the only way, you know, those kinds of like nuances is by trial and error. Yeah. And, um, and I feel like it's also good to recognize that it's not always the same for you at different times, like not even within like the same year or season. Cause like, to be clear right now, we're talking about like to be in peak shape, you need to be doing really peak workouts and really easy days. But you know, maybe in January, as you're getting ready for a peak in May or June, maybe in January, you're doing like a lot of moderate intensity work, but you're not doing like peak workouts at that time. Um, but I feel like, you know, what you might be doing this year might be very different than what you were doing three years ago versus, you know, three years from now, um, even with the same goals. Like even if you're doing the same type of racing calendar or you're trying to target the same PRs, like you're trying to set up 5K PR or whatever it is, like what works for you right now might be different because your body changes and there's many factors involved. Uh, and even right now also, you're mentioning the the variability in the warm-up routine uh, and like the pre-race routine it's like that reminds me of something that i find uh is like really valuable to me as a coach and also working with athletes and trying to communicate uh back and forth that like it's good to understand the intent of what the the point is and try to implement the intent more than like the detail of exactly like what the workout says sometimes and you should listen to your body and factor that into like what you're doing in training and anytime that somebody is expressing something in kind of a very inflexible ideological way i always um you see that as a flag that like somebody says you need to go out and ride for an hour and a half and do like three spin sprints at 800 watts and like that's exactly what you should be doing and if you're not doing exactly that you're doing it wrong like that's not helpful because you know, maybe that day, that's not the right thing for you that particular day, <laughs> or maybe it's good to try like not doing that. So you, um, get a good warm up in like the day of the race instead of the day before. Um, and I feel like that's something that everyone, both coaches and athletes should be receptive to is just like having a clear idea of what the intention is and what you're trying to accomplish in that session or in that week or in that month of training. Uh, but also being receptive to like how your body is experiencing the training and how it's responding and how your nutrition and your sleep and your hydration are and adjusting, you know, as needed along the way. Yeah. I, I think for like a lot of people who are getting started, they just don't go hard enough. That's why there's a lot of very simplification of the recommendations, which is like, Hey, just go really hard, do these sprints, like, uh, just follow this kind of, uh, program. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people like it's really hard to get the intensity out, particularly at the beginning. It doesn't feel good and it's very uncomfortable and your heart's freaking out and you've never done it before. But then there's a point where you've got some got some experience. And I think uh, you get to know your your body and you pay attention and you and you understand what works works for you. And I think like on that spectrum, right, the more personalized the training gets, I think the more you'll get out of yourself. But that just takes uh, time to to figure that piece out yeah and it's good to recognize that it's a skill uh on multiple scales to know like what's adequately hard for you and what's too hard and it's good to experience both of those things so it's good like on the scale of a particular workout to go out and like test like what's the hardest you can do for five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes and also like what's the hardest you might be able to do for like multiple repeats of that so like sometimes in my mind when i'm going out and training my idea is that i'm trying to do like multiple four minute efforts or 10 minute efforts and i don't really care about each individual effort i just want the highest average power for like the three by 12 minutes that i'm going to do or whatever it is um but unless you like go, sometimes go out and like overpace it a little bit like you don't know necessarily what you're fully capable of because like going out and doing like you know three by 10 minutes three to 12 minutes at let's say 300 Watts, that might be very hard for you, but maybe you could do 310. And if you never actually like try to do 310, like you, every time you do 300 Watts, it's going to feel really hard, but you might be able to handle 310 sometimes. And you need to try that out. And then also like over the course of your training program, sometimes you might be leaving, you know, 10 or 20% on the table that you could be doing, uh, like week to week workout to workout, but sometimes it is nice to slightly overreach in training so that you know 
what is actually too much and then you can back off. And like, if you're attentive to when you're feeling tired and when you're not able to execute your training, you can just back off and take a recovery week and it's fine. It's just the people that like keep going too hard day after day, week after week, forever that end up burnt out, you know, two or three months in. But um, the skill of going full gas in training on a particular workout and also just like building up a really hard training program um, over the course of weeks or months, uh, both are useful skills and take time to develop. So if you're a newer athlete and you're just like developing the skill of going as hard as you can, like that's that's fun. <laughs> you'll, you'll keep seeing peak power numbers or in PRs in, in your training um, for, for months or years, but it, it, it can keep going for a long time <laughs> for yeah. most of us. You know, you make a great point, right? You've got this spectrum and we've talked a lot about hey, you need to go harder and to get faster, you need to ride harder, right? And I think that that's probably the advice for most people who are non-aspiring athletes, they're working people, people who just want to like get fit and race and have a good time. And I think you're, there's another end of the spectrum, which is like younger people, aspiring athletes, people who really want to race where they go too hard uh, all the time. And that actually is another... Um, uh, challenging area for people. And I, I was sending that article uh, recently about Roger Bannister who broke the four minute mile and they were comparing his training to other people who were training at the time. So this is the early fifties, just after uh, World War II. And most coaches just recommended this high intensity training all the time. Like, like I actually couldn't believe that certain people did a hundred intervals a day and did them every day. It sounds insane. Like, I don't know, even in the pros, anyone who would do something like that um, in their in their training. Uh, and Bannister, he only did like 10 intervals a day or he had a much more moderate and modest program than a lot of the other pros. And he was the one who broke the four minute uh, mile, right? So I, I think that was where people saw that, hey, there might be like a limit, like when you're trying to just push the ceiling that you could just, just keep pushing and it's not beneficial. Uh, and this is something that you see with like younger people or people who are just like incredibly determined. They just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and your body needs an, uh, an opportunity to kind of like rest and recover and absorb that. Yeah. That I think that, that is the area where riding slow or running slow can help you get faster, but it's only when it's in conjunction with like adequately hard training to drive your fitness forward. Just infinite quantities of low intensity work is never going to help you get better. Like where we started in this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just like infinite quantities of high intensity training too, is yeah. not, is not necessarily the best uh, approach. Right. And there's a lot of like young people they get really excited and they start racing and they want to be really successful. And it's really easy for them to just double down on just riding hard all the time and doing too many races. I think even Eddie Merck said that he thought he raced too much um, and it compromised his health. And so you do, you do see this where it is possible to go too far uh, on the other, other side of the spectrum. Yeah. And that's, one area that is, I think, nice to have a coach or an experienced like friend that can check in on your training and see if you're just doing something that is outside the range of what sounds normal. Um, and also some of the newer tools with like heart rate variability and having power meters where you can see if you're continuing to get better or if you're just plateauing and declining and you're like, have the feeling that you're doing good training because you're tired half of the time, but maybe you're tired half the time because you like burnt yourself out after like three or four months of training too hard or because you're not going hard enough. Like, and that, that's something that is harder maybe to just kind of categorically offer advice about, but like sometimes, like you're saying, like sometimes people don't go quite hard enough to drive their fitness forward or they've been going like hard for too long and, and do like three or four hard workouts a week. Um, but I think in, in both of those situations, it's like good to recognize that like doing three quarters effort is going to get you like 90 or 95% result. And as you go from like 75, 80, 90% of what you can do, like you might be able to get closer and closer to your limit, but you're also exponentially increasing the amount of stress on your body. So sometimes like backing off a little bit and doing your favorite workout or doing a time trial on your favorite climb 
and seeing if you can perform well is a good way to like test if you're um, training too hard. And just that week of recovery helped you to like get way better all of a sudden because you just were burning yourself out. Or if you can't execute, um, maybe you're not training hard enough. And it's nice to have ways to like check in on, on how you're doing instead of just kind of guessing. When you're a pro, how did you gain, gauge rest? Did you ever feel like you had burned yourself out? I've actually heard it from other people I know, but what was your experience like? Um, so I think that over short time periods, sometimes I was very fit, but I wasn't totally sharp at local races because I was like training a bunch, like especially earlier on when I didn't have any like super key highlight races that I really wanted to be in peak shape for like tour of California. It's like, clearly that's a, an a race if you want to have that kind of terminology, but if, but earlier before I was racing professionally and I didn't have all these like high priority races, I might have races like three, four or five times a month from like February through August, just racing locally here in California. And it, you know, obviously you can't be in peak shape early on. I was getting better year after year. So I think that I kept riding that wave of just generally getting better. But I think that in my first few years, I didn't really have like peaks and valleys in my fitness. I was just like grinding it out and getting slowly fitter um, in a way that was effective because I, I was like one of the fitter people locally. But if I was going to professional races at that time, I really wouldn't have been able to hack it in the same way that I did later. I think later I was more willing to take days totally off. So I think like when I was racing Tour of California, I probably had more days off at that, like throughout the year later. Cause it's like, if it, it, it was a question of like, do I need to train more or get more recovery? I would always go for more recovery at that point because my train, my hard training was very hard and training 14 hours a week or 18 hours a week. Like I, I could care less about that as long as I could just really go hard and do like a really high quality five hour ride with a bunch of threshold and some VO2 max work and et cetera. Um, that was much more valuable to me than grinding it out at like 20 hours a week, week after week. Um, and like, there's no point in my professional racing where I wished I had done more volume over the intensity that I was doing, except maybe at TOC where we did seven days in a row and it was like 30 hours of racing. And late in the week, I could tell that I wasn't as good as I was like earlier in the week. Um, but at that time, it was like kind of a design constraint because I was still working uh, a good bit at the shop and doing some coaching work. So it's like I was making the most out of the, the schedule that I had, not being able to like get a massage every week and sleep 10 hours a day or, you know, what I would have done if I was getting paid enough to just focus entirely on racing. Um, and that's, you know, that's fine with me. Uh, I had a good time doing it and and did quite well there, I think, for, for what I was uh able to do like I don't think there was anyone else in the top 20 that was training like 15 or 16 hours a week on average throughout the year <laughs> yeah I think I think you also hit the nail on the head with like there definitely is a difference between like what a pro does and what an amateur does in terms of training and uh and I like like there are like hacks you can use and it's not my favorite word but there are like ways to maximize your your time yeah. you're training and you're an hack amateur. Hack is such a terrible term. A terrible term, right? It's not a hack. It's like there's ways to maximize training if you only have 10, 8, 12 hours a week. When you're professional and you're paid to ride and they ride like exactly 34 or 27 hours or whatever they do, it's 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 required because of the endurance and the intensity. Um, but they're still only training not even 40 day, 40 hours a week, right? It's it's throughout the entire week. It's like 32 or, or how are they? They yeah, usually no more than 30 with few exceptions for like grand tour specialists, usually like 20 low twenties for a lot of those guys. So even for them, there's a clear number and there's a clear amount of like quality uh, training that they can do in a given week. Yeah. We Cause any that. of them could do 30 plus hours anytime they wanted to, but it would just completely deteriorate the quality of their training. Right. They need to get the rest and the recovery and they need to have the hard days and they need to have the endurance so it's just like an amateur where you need the same thing. There's days where you need to go really hard to get faster. And there's days where you need to take it easy or, or rest or just work on the other, other attributes that do matter, right? The endurance part um, does matter because we we're talking about this in like terms of weight training as a good analogy for people where, you know, nobody believes that you can go to the gym and lift a 50 pound weight 
uh, 10 times. And that would enable you to lift a hundred pound weight, even like a couple of times, right? It's, it's very obvious. Like there's nobody who would prescribe that, but for some reason in the endurance sports world, there's a belief that if you run eight hours fairly moderately, somehow you're going to be able to break uh, your PR in the one minute uh, or then the one mile. And that's just not, it's not true. Um, you do need that intensity. I think the analogy of like how you work out in a gym is, um, is pretty good. Yeah. And like a nice corollary to that, which I think is useful. I, I like the weight training analogy is like, if you were, for example, training for Leadville and it is like a pure endurance event, like basically your aerobic efficiency is almost the only thing that matters like that. And your neuromuscular endurance maybe. Um, but you can't just go out and train like 10 hours every Saturday and, and hope to go faster at Leadville. Uh, but like going to the weight training analogy, like if your goal was to lift 50 pounds as many times as you could in an hour or, or something like that, like some arbitrary, like endurance type goal, like you could just go to the gym every day and like lift 50 pounds and try to like build up lifting it more over the course of an hour, or you could lift like hundred pounds and then 150 pounds. And if your pure power is like a lot higher, lifting 50 pounds just becomes really easy. And so, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll probably be able to lift it more like a higher quantity of times over a, a given period of time. Um, likewise, like if you can build your aerobic capacity from like 60 mils to like 65 mils, then everything becomes that much easier uh, because your VO2 max is almost 10% higher. So when you're operating at like 60 or 70% of your VO2 max, cause you're doing Leadville, it's effectively like 10% easier because you're a little bit fitter and increasing your VO2 max that 10% takes, you know, intensity and it takes, you know, some hard effort, but it's maybe 20 minutes of VO2 max intervals in three to five minute chunks, as opposed to going out and doing a 10 hour ride every Saturday. Um, yeah, I, I, I think like there's a lot of old school thought that still permeates the training, the training world. And I, I guess like in summary, I would say that like the precision that we have and how we can measure today with with power and with like sleep tracking and heart rate varied. there's a lot of things that we have now to understand like how hard and intense you went how good is your recovery that didn't exist in the old days and i think that that's how we can now dial in the training um and how we know that like uh a certain amount of intensity will improve your overall ability that amount of intensity varies for different people, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, but there really isn't anything that I understand that indicates you don't, you don't need the intensity um, and you'll, you'll get, you'll get better. So, so having access to those types of things, I think is like, is critical and that's how you can employ them to get faster. Yeah. And I think briefly touching on like the ways that we measure training quality or training intensity that reminds me of um a lot of people are familiar with the idea of tss and like power-based assessment of training quality and it's good to just understand what those things do and don't do so like specifically with tss it's trying to measure how much your training stress is but it's focused entirely on threshold conditioning and it's condensed it's like throwing out it's condensing of multi-dimensional space into a singular number in a way that gets rid of a lot of the data and nuance of what training session you're doing. So it's good to just be aware of like what each of those tools are and aren't telling you, because I think it's easier for people to get confused and think that like more TSS is going to mean better training, but it actually isn't. <laughs> you have to have good training and like good training often might mean possibly more TSS depending on what your goal is, but more TSS is never a training goal. And I've even heard or read other coaches communicating that it is, and that having more TSS is going to drive better fitness. But that also is that, that, that type of thinking that like more is better is almost never right. <laughs> like more is never better. Like the right amount is the right amount. More is usually counterproductive, just like less is counterproductive. Well, great. So, so what's the bottom line here? To get faster, what do people need to do? So you want to build up your aerobic conditioning so that you can do those really hard sessions and and like expand the limits of what your body is capable of. Um, usually that means two hard workouts a week and the rest of it's relatively easy. 
a few months out, maybe you're doing lots of moderate work, but you can't just go moderately hard all the time. You can't do just a lot of volume and not some really hard sessions to get your fitness forward. It's the really hard sessions that are really gonna expand your capacity to either go longer or go harder, set a PR on a climb, set a PR on the mile, whatever it is. And you need to go adequately easy or take enough rest days in order to be able to recover and capitalize on those workouts and also get ready for the next one. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I, uh, I agree with, uh, with all of that. And I would say like, go hard, uh, go easy and, uh, and have fun. Yes. So, fun is always a good component. <laughs> if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. You should adjust. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, Hey, um, like this video. Subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next week. Bye.